There's something about being home, where everything's just right. We're surrounded by people we love and trust. There's a feeling of stability and safety. And while some people get to experience this kind of home, many do not. Others might even be forced to leave their home and go live in a foreign land. We call this going into exile. Yeah, in exile, everything is disoriented. You're in the unknown. And in the story of the Bible, this is where the ancient Israelites found themselves, conquered by Babylon, living in exile far from their homeland. And so they had to ask themselves, how did we end up here? And is there any hope of going home? And the whole story of the Bible is designed to address those very questions. The whole story? Really? Yeah, go back to the first pages of the Bible. Where does humanity live? Okay, they live in this really sweet garden, their home. And they're there on one condition, that they trust and follow God's one command, and they don't. And so the consequence is banishment from the garden. Ah, they're sent into exile. Exactly. And so this story has been designed to set you up for Israel's story. How they were given the gift of the promised land and were able to stay there on one condition, that they be faithful to the terms of their covenant relationship with God. Uh, They didn't, and they were sent into exile. Welcome back to our teaching series on the story of the Bible. So we're going to talk about exile again in a few minutes. We're going to pick up where that video led us to. But first, we're going to do a little bit of a review. But let's first set the stage as to where we are in the story. Uh, 605 B.C. is kind of where Kevin left off last week with a group of people that God had chosen to work through called the Israelites. Uh, Kevin left us with 10 tribes in the northern kingdom, if you recall, the kingdom split in two after Solomon. And those 10 tribes in the north called Israel had already been conquered and dispersed by the Assyrians in 722 B.C. And the southern kingdom, the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, have now been conquered by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and removed from the promised land, more on the promised land in a minute in our review, and taken into exile in Babylon. And that really, the dates given is about 586 B.C., but the conquest actually started in 605 B.C., took about 19 years. The first removal of the Israelites from Judah, uh, we'll get to in a minute, but the final removal wasn't complete until the destruction of the temple and of Jerusalem itself in 586 B.C. Now, a quick review of how we even got to that point in the story. We started in Genesis 1 several weeks ago with the creation of the universe, or at least most of the universe, including the first two human beings, Adam and Eve. They were created by God. The universe was and they were the most powerful and wonderful being in the universe, the author of life and the creator himself, who exists, we find out, as the story progresses in three forms. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We as Christians now refer to God as the Trinity. Adam and Eve are given a home in a beautiful garden called Eden, where God and other spirit beings who have been created much earlier in the story are free to interact with these two human beings. It's not just God that can come and interact with them, but it's other spirit beings. A rebellious spirit being manifesting as a serpent deceives Adam and Eve into joining him and other spirit beings who are in rebellion against God and God's value system. Why God allowed that spirit being to have access to Adam and Eve, I don't fully understand, but he did. Maybe it was some form of test. That rebellion brought a curse when Adam and Eve joined the serpent, so to speak. It brought a curse on all of God's creation. But God quickly gives us the first hope of redemption from the curse of sin and death in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. The first hint of a Savior, a Deliverer, or Messiah. She says this, speaking to the serpent, Speaking to the woman and to the man, I will put enmity or division or strife between you and the woman and between your offspring. Does Satan have offspring? Jesus referred to anyone that aligns with him and his value system. He referred to the Jewish religious leaders of his day as sons of the devil. That's strong language. But Satan certainly has offspring in that sense, human beings as well as spirit beings that have joined him in the rebellion. And her offspring, 
He's referring to a specific person eventually who will come. And he, this descendant of the woman, will eventually crush the head of the serpent. Thank you, God. And you will strike a mortal blow to his heel. The promise of a deliverer or a wounded savior appears over and over again in the Old Testament prophet's writings. It appears in many ways, by story, by allegory, by specific references. Well, things continue to spiral downward after that garden failure until God decides to start over to some degree, and he destroys part of his creation on planet Earth with a flood. Kind of a do-over, and he begins again with another man by the name of Noah and his family, but Noah and his family line fail morally quickly as well. And the curse of sin and death spread as people begin to populate the planet. Eventually, there's some kind of organized attempt by human beings to form a one-world government to come together in collaboration, represented by a giant structure called the Tower of Babel. God perceives it as rebellion against him. And God and some of his higher-ranking spirit beings, God refers to some of those higher-ranking spirit beings, call them higher-ranking angels if you want to, as sons of God. Some of them are good. Some of them turn out not to be so good. But God comes down with them and destroys the Tower of Babel, disperses the people across the face of the earth, and confuses our ancient ancestors' language. God also apparently grants, it's a little cryptic, but it's in there, some of these spirit beings, the right to rule behind the scenes, so to speak, portions of the people that he disperses and portions of the territories on earth. And God reserves to himself a group of people he's going to call out, called the Israelites. He refers to the Israelites in several places as his portion, the portion he keeps for himself. Then God continues to work his redemptive plan by working through one man, a guy by the name of Abraham. And throughout the story today, you're going to see the kingdom of this world and this world system that's manipulated by that serpent and by his allies is referred to in places as Babylon, particularly when you get to Revelation. So Babylon represents not just a specific kingdom, a specific place at one point in time. It is that but it represents a world system manipulated by the snake. And he continues to work his redemptive plan through this one man called Abraham. And Abraham actually lives in what will later be Babylon. And so he calls Abraham out of that culture, out of Babylon, where he probably worshiped the moon god, a place called, really cool name, I love the name, love to say it, Ur of the Chaldees is where he's from. I'm from Fayetteville, Abraham's from Ur of the Chaldees. And his descendants are later referred to as the Israelites. And God makes a covenant with Abraham and with his descendants. And Lee talked about this, and I expounded on it. It had three parts, land, seed, and blessing. The land referred to a promised land, a specific geographical place in the Mideast that God said, I'm going to give this to your descendants, Abraham. And seed refers to several things. It literally refers to, Abraham, I'm going to bless you with lots of descendants biologically. But it also refers, as we learn in the New Testament, to spiritual descendants. If you're here this morning and you know Jesus personally and intimately, if your spirit right now is bearing witness with God's spirit that you belong to him, if you're the apple of his eye, if you belong to Jesus, then you're one of Abraham's spiritual descendants. It also refers to back to Genesis 3.15, where it says the seed of the woman. And God says now it's going to be the seed of one of Abraham's descendants who will ultimately crush the head of the snake. So land and seed, and then just general blessing. This is a reference to God saying, if you'll keep the law I'm going to give you, if you'll keep the covenant I'm making with you, if you'll make me the one and only love in your life, the one true God, if you won't have other gods and other idols that you worship, other of these spirit beings, and if you'll treat people with kindness and respect, and I'm going to give you some rules and show you how to do that, and live according to my moral code, then I'm going to bless your socks off. <laughs> socks is not in there. That's a paraphrase. Morally, spiritually, with stuff, he's going to bless them materially. He promises blessings. Not only that, corollary, he promises blessings to anybody that blesses them. Land, seed, and blessing, the Abrahamic covenant. The Israelites end up for 400 years in Egypt. 
most of these years as slaves. And this isn't even punishment. It's just part of God's plan. It really wasn't any fault of their own. They end up as slaves in Egypt for centuries. God ultimately delivers them through a guy by the name of Moses. He works signs and wonders through Moses. And, and one of those last signs and wonders is he brings judgment on the Egyptian culture and strikes down the firstborn male in most of the households in Egypt. But for the Israelites, he says, symbolically, place the blood of a lamb over the doorpost of your houses. And when judgment comes one night in Egypt, I'll see the blood and I'll pass over. I won't destroy anyone in your household. And that points, of course, forward later to someone that John the Baptist and God refers to as the Lamb of God who was slain before the foundations of the world. And my faith and your faith in his atoning blood, his sin sacrifice. God wrote himself into his own story as the sin sacrifice, as a tremendous act of love to display to all those sons of God, all those rebel angels, and to you and me, how much he loves the children of Adam and Eve. He offers us an opportunity to be saved like those Israelites were, that the blood of the lamb atones or covers our sins. And, and he also, they also passed over out of Egypt through the waters of the Red Sea, which were parted. Miraculous signs and wonders. And God gives them a moral code I've already mentioned. He calls it the law. Again, it's focused, Jesus said, on loving God and loving people. And they rebel quickly in the wilderness. Even all these incredible, supernatural, powerful events are happening to them, and they still rebel against God. He says, okay, I'm going to cause this generation to wander around in the wilderness and not get into the promised land for 40 years. Still, he provides them food and water and supernatural guidance, fire by night and a cloud by day to guide them. And their children entered the promised land of a guy by the name of Joshua, Moses' successor. And God brings judgment this time through the Israelites on the Canaanites. One of the reasons he wouldn't let them enter the promised land 400 years before is because the Canaanites weren't wicked enough yet to bring judgment on them. He was giving them a longer chance to repent and turn back to God. And they didn't. They kept getting worse and worse and worse. And finally, God uses the Israelites to bring judgment on the people that occupy the promised land, generally referred to as the Canaanites. What were their sins? There were three, generally, the Bible speaks about. They were violent and lawless. They were worshipers of idols and demons, and they even sacrificed their children to demons, and God hates all that. And they were sexually perverse, that's right, and immoral. They violated God's design for sexuality and for human flourishing. And so God said, I'm going to, after years and years and years of this, wipe, wipe you out and punish you. And so they occupied the land, the Israelites did, and drove a lot of the Canaanites, not all of them, out. And God said, after they occupied the land, they entered this period of time where they started to do the same thing that the Canaanites were doing. Those same three sins, child sacrifice, demon worship, lawlessness, violence, sexual perversion and immorality, and just generally violate all of God's laws for flourishing and how to live on this planet. And they go and enter this period of time called the sin cycle where it's just this period for about 300 years, it's going to be just moral failure of an epic proportion, and then judgment by God, and then deliverance by a man, in some cases a woman, that God would raise up to be like a tribal chieftain, a warlord that would defeat the Canaanites who God was using to oppress them because of their sin. And then they would have a time of blessing and peace, and then they'd fall right back into this same trap of all these, this immorality and this sin. And that goes on for 300 years. And, and a verse that describes that period of time is Judges 21, 25. It describes anarchy. In those days, Israel had no king, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Sad state of affairs. And then God gives them a king. First king is Saul, then David, then Solomon. And Kevin profiled Solomon's life last week. More on that in just a minute. And because of these three kings' sins, if you're in that position of leadership, your sin has more impact. And it affects the whole nation, the whole culture, particularly Solomon's sin. 
Because of that, the kingdom splits after Solomon's death, again, into those northern ten tribes and those southern two tribes, the tribes of Judah. And then there's a period of time where there's like 20 kings in the north. They're all bad. They're all idol worshipers, demon worshipers, sacrificing their children, sexually immoral, violent. Back to the two kings, God does eventually bring judgment, as the Lord stated, 722 B.C. on the northern kingdom, 605 to 586 B.C. on the southern kingdom of the Babylonians, which brings us finally down to what that little video was about, the exile, which lasts approximately 70 years before a portion of the Israelites will return to occupy a portion, at least, of the promised land. So let's watch another Bible Project video right now that explains the way of exile. In the year 587 BC, the city of Jerusalem was attacked by the Babylonian Empire. And a year later, the city and the temple were plundered and burned. Thousands of Israelites were taken from their homes and relocated all over ancient Babylon. They became exiles. And so now they're a minority surrounded by a new culture with new gods. Now, some Israelites chose to resist Babylon by revolting or withdrawing. Others gave in, adopting the Babylonian way of life and accepting these new gods as their own. And you might think those are your only two options, but the prophet Jeremiah told them to do something totally different and surprising. To settle in, build houses, plant gardens, grow families, and most surprisingly, to seek the well-being of Babylon and pray to the Lord on its behalf. So this is like a third way. Yeah, it's not compromise or revolt. What does it look like? Well, there's a whole book of the Bible that explores that question. It's the story of Daniel. Daniel was one of the Israelites taken into the Babylonian exile. And because Daniel had a royal heritage and education, he was recruited along with some friends to work in the high court of Babylon. Work for the enemy? That would be compromise. Or they could gain the king's trust, take him down from the inside. That's what you might expect. But instead, they take Jeremiah's advice and choose the third way. They serve the king of Babylon, taking on Babylonian names and even clothing style. So they seek Babylon's well-being. But in doing so, aren't they just giving up their heritage? It could seem that way, but actually they aren't. As you read on, the story focuses on moments where they draw the line and they choose faithfulness to their God and resist the influence of Babylon. So, for example? Well, like when they're commanded to bow down to the idol of Babylon and give allegiance to the king as if he's a god. Ah, they won't go that far. Right. This is where you see their true loyalty. It requires them to critique Babylon's idolatry of power, its arrogance, its injustice. But they do it nonviolently by laying down their lives. And so God vindicates Daniel and his friends for their faithfulness. So they would serve Babylon, seek its well-being, but their loyalty was always to God. Yeah, this is what Jeremiah was envisioning. The way of the exile is a combination of loyalty and also subversion. So they're still exiles. But don't Daniel and his friends long to go home? Yes. In fact, Daniel believed that God was going to send a ruler to bring down Babylon and create a true kingdom of peace. Ah, when did he think this ruler would come? Well, at first he thought within his lifetime, but then he had a dream where he found out that after Babylon would come another oppressive empire, then another, then another. And so Babylon did fall and Israel did get to go back home, but now they're ruled by Babylon's successors. And so they maintained the mindset of an exile waiting for their true home to come to them. And they continued the same practice of loyalty and subversion to any new versions of Babylon that came along. And this leads us to the time of Jesus. The empire of his day was Rome, ruled by Caesar. Now, some Israelites wanted to resist, while others gave in and adopted Roman culture and its gods. But watch Jesus carry on the subversive loyalty of Daniel. Like when he said, it's fine to pay taxes to Caesar, give him back his coins. But then he said, don't mistake Caesar for God. God's the one who deserves your total life and allegiance. So the way of Jesus is this same mix of loyalty and subversion. Yeah, like he taught his followers to love and even bless their enemies. But he also got arrested for speaking out against the corrupt leaders of Jerusalem and Rome. He critiqued their idolatry of power and it cost him his life. 
But God vindicated him by raising him from the dead as the true king of the nations. The king that Daniel had hoped for. Right. And Jesus promised that one day his kingdom would prevail. And so until then, his followers are living in a type of exile. Yeah, this is why the Apostle Peter calls followers of Jesus foreigners and exiles. He told them to respect the authorities of whatever place you happen to live, to honor and love all people. But then he reminds them that this isn't their true home. They're still living in Babylon. But Well, they're not living in Babylon. Babylon doesn't exist anymore. Or does it? In the Bible, Babylon has become a symbol that describes any human institution that demands allegiance to its idolatrous redefinitions of good and evil. Okay, so we all live and work in Babylon. How do I seek the well-being of Babylon while my allegiance is to someone greater? Yes, Jesus' followers are called to live in that tension between loyalty and subversion. That's the way of the exile. We start by reading Jeremiah 29 again. I think we'll refer to it in that video. Jeremiah 29, 4 through 7. This is God speaking to the exiles at that time. It's a word for us. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carry into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant your gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters to marry so that that too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. He's saying prosper. Try to prosper there. Also, seek the peace and the prosperity of the city of the place in which I carried you to the exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. I want to spend a little time now talking about the book of Daniel. This is a book that was written during this time period of the exile. The book of Daniel is, to some degree, it's a case study on how to live in exile. So it's incredibly important to us in the church age. All of us, no matter what country we're living in, are living in exile to some extent. We're not part of this world system. We're from another place. What that is to me. All right, the book of Daniel begins in 605 BC. When Nebuchadnezzar begins his conquest of Judah, he starts to haul off into exile Babylon, some of the best, the brightest, and the beautiful, so to speak, of the people of Judah. Among those are Daniel and three of his friends. They fall into this category. And part of this book is about their lives in exile under four different kings and two different cultures. All of these young men, probably taken as teenagers, will die in exile. They'll live all of their adult lives and die in exile. Four kings they serve under are living in two different cultures. First, the Babylonian culture. Nebuchadnezzar, obviously. And then his son is accepted in Belshazzar. And then there was a leader of Persian King Darius who defeated, kind of overtook Belshazzar in the famous story told by Daniel one night. And then there's the more famous Persian King Cyrus the Great. Daniel dies during Cyrus's reign. The book chronicles the compliance at times of Daniel and his friends. We're going to look at that. With the foreign culture, they're exiled. It also highlights their resistance at times. You know two famous stories from the book of Daniel about the boy's resistance or the man's resistance. It's Daniel and the lion's den. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We'll look at their names and how they got them in just a minute. Daniel's three friends and the fiery furnace. In each case, it involves them keeping the first commandments and having no other gods before them and worshiping no other gods other than the one true God and then being persecuted. Really, they thought they were going to kill them because of their obedience to God and their resistance to the commands of the culture. We learn that living in exile requires nuance. It requires discernment about when to comply and when to resist. So let's take a look at the book right now as a story. If you have a Bible, I invite you to turn 
to chapter 1 of the book of Dan. I've got the first chapter on the screen if you don't have a Bible with you. But if you have a Bible or you can find it on your phone, do it. It's not in the notes because I added this yesterday. I wanted to tell the story. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, again, this is 605 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged the city. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These Nebuchadnezzar carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. God is willing to suffer humility to bring obedience to his people. He waited and he waited and he waited. Uh, and finally, after 20 kings in the north and 20 kings in the south, all bad in the northern kingdom, 20 kings in the south, some were good, some were bad, but he got tired of it. And finally he brought judgment on the people and he takes them into exile. Verse 3, then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of the court officials, to bring into the king's service some of these Israelites from the royal family and nobility. Young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. And he was to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians. Don't miss this. <laughs> They're going to dress like Babylonians. They're going to learn the Babylonian literature, which is all about demonic worship, and their religion is woven into all of this. They're going to learn the Babylonian language. Not only that, we're going to see that he's going to change all four young men's names literally to the names of Babylonian gods, to demons. They're going to have their names changed to demons. The king assigns them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were trained for three years, and then they're to enter the king's service, like the civil service, maybe of our government. Among those chosen from Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. Now, I don't understand why, in the rest of the story, Daniel is referred to as Daniel most of the time. And maybe it's because Daniel's writing it. And his three friends are referred to most of the time by their pagan or their Babylonian name. That's just kind of one of those, I don't know. But that's the way it is for the rest of the story. But don't let it confuse you. Verse 8, key verse, key word, key verb. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself. He made up his mind he would only go so far. And where he draws the line, I don't fully understand why we're not given a lot of uh, explanation at this point. Is this a pork thing? Maybe, maybe not. Probably not. Probably he won't eat the royal food and the wine, verse 8, that he's asked to eat. The king thinks the sacrifice is a good thing. He's giving him the best. He don't want to eat it. And, and he starts to negotiate. Now hear this. He's negotiating with the culture. And he's doing it in a submissive and a humble way. And, and it probably didn't want to eat this food and wine because it's been sacrificed to idols. That's my best guess. We don't know, but he draws the line. Verse 9. Now God calls the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. But the official told Daniel, Hey, man, I'm afraid of my boss, the king. And he's going to kill me if you guys show up all emaciated and awful looking because these other guys ate all the good food and drank wine and you all are just living on you know crumbs. So he didn't want that. That's a loose paraphrase of verse 10. The king will have my head, he said, because of you. And Daniel says to the guard, who the chief official has appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Please test your servants for 10 days. He just says, I'm just proposing a test. You give us vegetables and water. See what we look like. Interview us. How we talk. Are our minds clear at the end of 10 days and compare us to everybody else? So we agreed. Verse 14. He tested for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, they look healthy. Better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard says, okay, away with their choice food. Let them drink water and give them vegetables instead. 
to these four young men, God blessed. He prospered them because of their obedience. He gave them knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. They could set the curve on the Babylonian ACT, okay? They were at Harvard, so to speak, of their day. And they're setting the curve. And Daniel can understand in addition to that, supernatural things, dreams and visions of all kinds. He's spiritually gifted. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief officials presented them to Nebuchadnezzar three years later. The king interviews him. He talks to him. All these people, not just these four, but probably 100 or more. He found none equal to these four young men. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They entered the king's service, and in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned him, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters. Not just the college graduates, but the seasoned veterans in his whole kingdom. Don't miss verse 21. We'll get to it in just a minute, what it means. But I'm going to tell you right now. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. Four kings... Two cultures, Daniel will die in exile. He'll die there. It's going to be about 70 years later. He's probably in his late 80s when he passes away. We'll get to the end of the story in just a minute. He's going to live under four foreign kings. Nebuchadnezzar, a Babylonian, one culture. Belteshazzar, Nebuchadnezzar's son, again, a Babylonian culture. That will be conquered by the Medo-Persian Empire, a guy by the name of Darius he'll live under, another king. And then finally, he'll die under a famous king by known as Cyrus the Great, another Persian. Babylonian and Persian cultures. That would be incredibly difficult. We're going to change cultures in the middle of your life. Change pagan gods, change demons you're asked to worship to. Change customs and habits and even language again. That's a rough life. And so that's the life of Daniel and his three friends. The book chronicles the compliance at times of Daniel and his friends with the foreign culture they're exiled in. The resistance at times is highlighted by the famous stories that most of you know of Daniel and the lion's den. That's not compliance. That's resistance. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, in both those cases, it basically... Because they wouldn't violate the first commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind and not worship idols or anything set before you other than God. And and God delivers them. He doesn't always do that. Hebrews chapter 11, go there. Lots of people die and suffer. Jesus did because of their obedience to God. But in this case, they were delivered. And by the way, well, let's... We learn that living in exile requires nuance and discernment. Let's go to the end of the story. Daniel chapter 12, the last chapter of Daniel. Daniel's had dreams and visions throughout the story, lots of them. And he's interpreted dreams and visions of these kings. He's a big time supernaturalist, okay? With lots of supernatural giftings. But a lot of these visions and dreams he has are about the end of time. And he doesn't understand all of them. Sometimes God will give him explanations. He'll even send angels that will have to fight through ruling principalities and powers. Go back to the Tower of Babel. There are principalities and powers, demons, that have authority. And sometimes the angels have to fight through to get to Daniel. Daniel chapter 10 and explain things to Daniel. But he doesn't fully understand this last vision he has of the end times. It's the end of his life now. He's in his 80s and God's speaking. At that time, Michael, God speaking to Daniel, an angel, the great prince who protects your people, what time? The end of time will arise. There will be a time of distress, the great tribulation, such as has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people... That's you and me if you know Jesus. We're his people. Everyone whose name is found written in the book. If you know Jesus, your name is written in the book of life. We'll be delivered. Hallelujah. Praise God. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awaken. Some to everlasting life. Others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise, if you're smart, Jim, you'll believe the story. You'll embrace the truth. If you do, you will ultimately shine like the brightness of heaven. 
And if you lead many to righteousness, you'll be like the stars shining forever and ever. But you, Daniel, in the meantime, just roll up and seal the book up, the word of the scroll, and in the end of time, people are going to go here and there across the earth for centuries and centuries, and knowledge will increase, skip down to the last verse. But as for you, Daniel, basically God's saying, you've done a great job, son. You've lived it out. You've finished strong. Go your way until the end of your days. You ain't got long left. The sand's about to run out of the hourglass. You just keep doing, Daniel, the next right thing. Don't miss this. This is for you and me. Jim, you just keep doing the next right thing. And until the day I call you home, you will ultimately rest. That means die. And then at the end of days, that's the end of time, you will rise from the dead, a bodily resurrection, to receive your allotted inheritance. I want you to think about something just for a minute. I want you to compare the life of Daniel in exile to the life of Solomon sitting on the throne. And think about it. Here's a guy that had all of it. He wasn't in a pagan culture. He could set the culture. He could define culture any way he wanted. What kind of example did he set in his day and time? How did he abuse power? He abused money. He abused women. He abused his position. He abused the people. He made them his slaves. And here's Daniel, rattled, living under four pagan kings. Your name's been changed to a demonic deity. You have to go to religion classes about astrology. And you spend your whole life off balance. And yet he finishes strong. What an example. What a story. Two stories from the Bible about two men's lives. Well, let's go to the New Testament now. God gives us in the church age more guidance. I'm going to read three passages of Scripture real quickly on how to live in exile. We too are citizens of another kingdom. Like Jesus told Pilate right before he was executed, my kingdom and your kingdom, it's not of this world. It's not. In Romans 13, Paul tells us to obey the laws of the land. Again, that was written at a time when Christians were being persecuted in the Roman Empire. Submit to the authority structures. Jesus tells us to pay taxes. But here's some words of warning about when to resist. 1 John 2, 15 through 17. John writing late in his life. I do not love Jim. Put your name in here. It was written to you and I. Jim, don't love the world. He's not talking about don't appreciate the beauty of a night sky or the mountains or the leaves changing or the rivers and the streams. We'll see what he's talking about in just a minute. He's talking about the world system, the world order, the Babylon that's manipulated by the snake or anything in this world system. If anyone loves this world system, the love of the Father is not in them. For everything in this world order, this world system, what's in it? The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the boastful pride of life. My sin nature allowed to run amok, and manipulated by spirit beings. Comes not from the Father, but from the world system and from the snake. The world system and its desires, the lust of the eyes, the lust of flesh, the boastful pride of life, will pass away. But whoever does the will of God and seeks to live his way will live forever. What an incredible promise. How to live in exile today in Babylon. Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2, another New Testament writer, Paul. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, He's here this morning saying this to you. The Holy Spirit is. I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's incredible mercy, in view of his atoning sin sacrifice, in view of him stepping out of time and eternity and offering himself up as your substitute, in view of all of that, in view of heaven, in view of the Holy Spirit of the living God living inside of you, in view of eternal life, Offer your body, Jim, 360 degrees. When you're playing, when you're working, when you're at home, whatever you're doing as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, that's your true and proper way to worship with your life. Don't conform to the pattern of this world. Don't be squeezed in this world system. 
but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do I renew my mind? One of the ways is I read this book every day. I strongly encourage you to. And then I speak to God. I engage myself. You should too. And I'm, many of you are. You've taught me to do it. Spiritual disciplines. You're doing one this morning. You're gathering together to worship God with your brothers and sisters. Giving generously and sacrificially. Serving other people. Having faith conversations w- with other people. On and on it goes. Those basic things that Christians have done for centuries. Then you will be able to attest and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. One more New Testament writer, the video referred to him, it's Peter. First Peter 2, 9. Hear this, hear this. You, you're a chosen people. I don't understand this chosen thing. I chose God at an early age, and I keep choosing him. But God chose me too. You're a chosen people. The Bible calls you a called out one, the elect. You're a royal priesthood, a member of a royal family. Priests who minister to God and people. You're a holy nation, citizens of another kingdom. You're God's special profession. He refers to you as the apple of his eye. Your name is written in the palm of hand. Jude, Jesus' brother, says this. Someday he will prevent you to his daddy with great joy. This is Jim, my beloved. Don't you want to hear those words? You may declare to him by your life. The praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. That's how we're to live in exile. Verse 11, Peter, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the boastful pride of life. They're waging war, Jim, against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that the A... When they try to accuse you of doing wrong, they have to see your good deeds. They have to glorify God. That's how we're to live in exile. Daniel also contains prophetic dreams, as I've already mentioned, about the future that have been interpreted various ways throughout church history. Portions of those prophetic dreams have already been fulfilled, but others have not. The brook predicts the rise of the Roman Empire and the destruction of the Jewish temple in 70 A.D., And a pattern emerges from the prophetic dreams. The kings of this world, again, represented by the term Babylon, are corrupt. Ultimately, they're all corrupt. They're all generally manipulating control at times by demonic spiritual forces that oppose the ways of God. Ultimately, all these governments and kingdoms will fail. And only Jesus, our king, has the purity, the capacity, and the sovereign right to rule. God will ultimately bring judgment on these kingdoms, and Jesus will someday rule. Isaiah puts it this way. In Isaiah chapter 24, verse 21, he says this. In that day, I'm referring to judgment day, and there will be a judgment day, the Lord will punish the powers in the heavens, referring to those rebellious sons of God, those rebellious angels, and the people they're manipulating The power structures on earth, the kings on the earth below. Any that have rebelled against him. Daniel, last verse, and I'm going to close. Daniel 7, 13 and 14, one of my favorite Old Testament passages. It's a great passage of great hope and power and victory. Daniel's having one of his visions. He has lots of them at night. He says, in one of my night visions, I looked, and there before me was someone like a son of man. That's Jesus' favorite reference to himself, son of man. Jesus is coming. Riding the clouds of heaven. Fast forward 700 years. Jesus has been crucified. He's been resurrected. He's been on the earth for 40 days. Now he's ascending to his father. How did he go? Riding in a cloud. What did the angels say that were standing there watching? He says, guys and gals, Someday he's going to come back in the same way you just saw him lead, riding the clouds of heaven. Daniel saw it seven centuries before. He approaches the Ancient of Days. That's God. He's led into his presence. He's given authority, glory, and sovereign power. And all nations and all peoples of every language will worship him. 
His dominion, how long will it last? Forever. It's an everlasting dominion that will not last away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. It gets better. Verse 18. But the holy people, that's you. That's you if you belong to him. The holy people of the Most High will receive the kingdom with him. We'll be part of the royal family, ruling with it, and we'll possess it forever. And Daniel says, in case you didn't catch that, Tim, I said, yes, forever and ever. That's good news. That's really good news. There are 318 references to the second coming of Christ in the New Testament. We are a people of hope. Where's the worship thing? I'm about to quit. Y'all better get up here. <laughs> I'm wound down. We are a people of hope, living with anticipation and the expectation that our king will return and he will make all things new. But until then, you and I live in exile. But as long as we have breath, we have been given the right and privilege daily to choose whether to be part of the rebellion against God represented by this world order of Babylon that will end in judgment Sunday, or to live connected to God, looking forward to the day that we will reign and rule as a member of God's royal family. I choose God, and I choose life, and I choose hope, and I choose eternal bliss. How about you? Let's stand and engage God in worship. If you're on the prayer team, if you want to come on up, and receive anyone that wants prayer.